So hello everyone, a really, really warm welcome for me at Donna Utah here at the London Buddhist Center. Um, lovely to see all of you saying hello already. Um, so it sounds like we've got the men's community in Berlin, um, Jill from the Barbican, Adriana, Veria Bodhi all the way from Stockholm. Oh. Um, from people from Ireland, Julianne, um, Sophie, Kay. Oh, Kay. Kay's all the way in Australia. Huh? Yeah, you know, James, James is um, mom, I think. Hello. Yeah, Michael Bond is watching from upstairs. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and they're all saying hello to, to each other and to us. Yeah. So, yeah, so hi, everyone. Nina's here from New York City. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really, really um, lovely to see all of you. Um, well, sort of see all of you. <laughs> um, it's a delightful um, little online sangha that we've um, built um, here on our little YouTube channel um, at the London Buddhist Center. Um, so um, hope all of you are sitting comfortably. We're going to be starting in just a couple of moments, um, but do say hello if you've just joined us. It's lovely to know who is um, here watching tonight. Mm. Hi, Sophia. And oh, yeah, Sanjay. Sanjay's here. Sanjay's su supporting Subuti in the mornings this week. So very, very nice to have you, Sanjay, joining us in the evening as well. Um, hello, Emma, uh, for all the way from Sheffield. Um, Mercia. Mercia's here. That's great. Nice to see you again, Mercia. Um, Patrick. Oh, hey, Patrick. Good. Um, Andrew, Andrew Ravenscroft, who became a Mitra in the lockdown, is here. Um, Danny is here as well. So just a minute more and we'll start at seven o'clock. So yeah, really, really warm welcome to all of you. Um, tonight we're going to have um, Subuti um, in conversation with me. Um, before that, in a moment, I'm just going to hand over to Surya Gupta, who's the chair of the London Buddhist Centre, and she's just going to introduce Subuti and say a quick hello. Um, but yeah, do, do keep on saying hello to, um, to us uh, and to each other. Yeah, oh, Ruby's here as well. That's great, that's great. Hi, Jane, hi, David. Oh, David's here all the way from Mexico. Oh. Yeah, David's been great, actually. He's been on teams for the London Buddhist Center um, all the way from Mexico. So yeah, special welcome to you, David. Yeah, uh, yeah, Natalia's here. Um, I usually do a, st a Mitra study group with Natalia on Monday evenings, but the whole of my Mitra study group mm -hmm. is joining us today uh, on the YouTube instead. Hi, Kalpna. Uh, Kalpna is one of our real regulars on our YouTube channel. And Debbie's here. And Karen D. Karen D. all the way from um, Tiratna Loka is here. Wonderful, really wonderful. Good. Um, so it's 7 p.m. Um, so I'll just hand over to Surya Gupta. Thank you very much, uh, Dani Ta. Uh, I've, I've been handed over to. Um, great, fantastic. Um, yeah, and it's lovely to be here. Um, welcome to you all as well. I'm really just popping on to say hello. Um, and I've been having a little chat with Sabuti and Dan Utah just before this. And I want to just say how lovely it looked, the backdrop of Dan Utah looks actually, because she's got the, we're in a different shrine room. We're going to have this shrine room the whole of this week. And we have the Buddha behind uh, Dan Utah, but also we've got the Sangha, we've got the, his followers uh, and, you know, sort of bodhisattvas. And it just feels a very lovely fitting backdrop actually to uh, our event uh, this week. Um, because we have Sabuti, we have a very special guest, Sabuti, our president visiting us this week. And as our president, he comes once or twice a year, often twice a year to the LBC. And in that time, he'll, he'll meet up with many, many people from the community um, and really getting a sense of, of them and giving them whatever uh, spiritual guidance, um, and just show interest in their, in their, in their progress. Um, and he'll also teach as well. And he teaches a real depth of commitment and enthusiasm and knowledge. 
Um, so, and we benefit from that at the London Buddhist Centre. We'll often, um, you know, really absorb his teachings and sort of then really make it our own through the year. That's often what we do when Sabuti comes to visit because they're very, very rich um, at what he has to say. So, um, and at the end of his visits, he normally then uh, meets me as chair and gives me a general impression as to how the center's doing in terms of the community, um, as well as the, the how we're doing generally in terms of running the center as well. Um, so I'm very, very pleased that, you know, even in the conditions we have, that Sabuti is really maintaining uh, that commitment to us as a community by visiting us virtually um, you know, this week and next week, actually, he'll be here visiting individuals and meeting individuals next week. But this week, he's going to be teaching. He is teaching. He's teaching in the mornings, our morning meditations, and he's teaching every evening uh, this week. Um, so really happy that you're with us. Um, and uh, yes, do do stay uh, with the week. Really encourage you because usually what happens is, is that the teachings really build over time and we really get a real sense of uh, Sabuti's depth and understanding of the of the Dharma. Um, and tonight we have uh, Dhanu Tar and she's going to be our first um, person interacting with Sabuti. So some of you will have, have seen me and Sabuti have various conversations and I've interviewed him in the past um, and this week if we felt it was really uh, great actually for Sabuti to be connecting uh, with a range of other order members uh, at the London Buddhist Centre um, and with different experiences, different backgrounds, um, different personalities of course um, and I think from there you'll get a sense of yeah, you know, how Sabuti responds really. Um, and you get a flavor of the different interactions uh, as well as the theme. So the theme they're gonna be exploring this week is a very important theme. It's on the five spiritual faculties. I'm not gonna to say too much about it, except to say this is really fundamental teaching to uh, anyone really living a spiritual life. Um, and very particularly important to us in Sri Ratna um, in terms of how we approach cultivating, you know, spiritual qualities through the course of our, our lives. So I'm very, very pleased that Sibuti is going to be exploring this theme with us, five different qualities across the week, five different faculties, going to be exploring that with five different uh, ordained members, um, all who are very keen and enthusiastic uh, to explore this topic with Sibuti. Um, so tonight we have Dhanu Tar. she's kicking us off um, and many of you will know Dhanu Tar as a very, very accomplished uh, yoga teacher, meditation, dharma teacher um, and she has a very, very clear mind, a very, very astute mind and uh, yeah, I think it's fantastic that you're, that you're starting us off Dhanu Tar. Um, and I'm really, uh, really ex excited really to kind of see how, well, how this topic is going to unfold this evening that you're going to be looking at. Um, and also see, well, you, you enjoy your connection with Sabuti. So thank you very much, Sabuti, for coming, for spending all this time with us um, this week. Uh, we will benefit from it. We always do benefit from it in so many different ways. And thank you, Dhanu Tar, for starting uh, this series of talks off uh, this evening. So I'm going to hand back to Dhanu Tar, and I'm going to be tuning in. <laughs> Great. Great. All right. Thanks, uh, Siri Gupta. Good, yeah. So just to add my thanks as well, Sabuti, um, thank you for coming to do this presidential visit, uh, even if it is virtually. And um, so I thought um, what I, yeah, what I, what I, um, sorry, there's a little bit of like flicking around going on with the Zoom. Everything okay? Yeah? Okay, good. Just checking with, in with the tech team. Yeah, so um, yeah, do you, yeah, thanks to Booty. Um, so this week, uh, what we've done is we've asked you, uh, we've asked you for a teaching, we've asked you um, if you would teach us about the system of practice, um, about the um, five essential aspects of spiritual life, um, integration, which is what we're going to be exploring tonight, um, positive emotion, receptivity, spiritual rebirth, and spiritual death. Um, and I thought, what I would do is to start by asking you, is this a Buddhist teaching? So is this a Buddhist teaching? Um, and I thought I'd just say that uh, for me, uh, I, I think I, I, I see myself, I recognize myself as a faith type uh, practitioner who's drawn on by faith. 
Um, so a sense of lineage is really important to me. In fact, when I first started teaching at the London Buddhist Center, I used to feel a little bit embarrassed um, because I felt like I was teaching um, what my teachers taught me. Um, I felt like I was often teaching like Maitre Bandi's um, Life at Full Attention or Journey in the Guide. You know, whatever I was teaching, I seemed to be just teaching that. And um, one day I had a conversation with him about it, just like slightly sheepishly said, um, well, I feel like I'm just teaching your material, Maitre Bandhu. And he said, he told me not to worry about it. And he said that I'm just trying to teach what Subhuti is trying to teach. And Subhuti is trying to teach what Bhante is trying to teach. And Bhante is trying to teach what the Buddha has been trying to teach. Um, so I thought I'd just sort of start off there. You know, this thing of um, integration, positive emotion, receptivity, spiritual rebirth, uh, spiritual death. Are these, um, is this a teaching um, that's a Buddhist teaching. That the Buddha taught. Yeah, that, yeah, that the Buddha taught a Buddhist teaching, yeah. Uh, well, first of all, I'm delighted to be uh, in interaction with you, Dana Utah, uh, and to be doing so in the company of so many people, and especially pleased to hear people from Mexico and Australia and, and, uh, and so on and so forth. So is the teaching of the, the five aspects or the, the system of meditation, the five stages of uh, the, the system of meditation, is it a, a Buddhist teaching and is it the Buddha's teaching? Those are slightly different questions. Mm -hmm. um, it, I suppose the first thing is that this teaching is Sangharakshita Bhante's uh, presentation of a teaching that is found especially in the Yogacara tradition and going back into the Savastivada tradition. Mm -hmm. and anybody who knows anything about Buddhist history will know that there are many different early schools of Buddhism. And one of the most important, one, the one that gave rise really to the Mahayana was called the uh, Savastivada. Uh, Savastivada. Um, so in the, in the uh, early period um, before the common era and in the early period of the common era, um, so it, it derives from there, and especially it derives from the teaching that's found in uh, the, the, the Yogacara, uh, sometimes referred to as the five, five paths. Uh, but Sangharakshita, as always, has interpreted it, or presented it rather, in his own way. Um, he regarded himself as a translator, uh, not in the in the sense of from one language to another, but from one culture, one uh, um, particular uh, perspective into another, in other words, into our modern world. So you will be able to recognize very clearly the antecedents of everything in this um, in this teaching in the, the tradition that's come down to us, especially from the Mahayana, from the Yogacara and back to the Savastivada. Now, is it the Buddha's teaching? Well, mm -hmm. what is the Buddha's teaching? Uh, uh, in, it, I suppose that what one is principally asking is, it, is one able to find this in the Pali Canon, for instance, or the equivalent texts from uh, the Chinese and uh, Tibetan traditions, which uh, are translations from the Sanskrit and other Prakrit languages? Uh, it, you probably won't find it in so many words in the Buddha's teaching, but you'll be able to see that it's completely consistent with the Buddha's teaching. You'll, you'll be able to uh, say, well, that corresponds to this in the Buddha's teaching. But don't ask me to do that right now, Dun Utah, although I shouldn't have even given you that, that opportunity, but I'm sure that I could do. The Buddha taught Anapanasati, the Buddha, which is integration. The Buddha taught uh, um, Metta Bhavna, Maitri Bhavna which is uh, positive emotion. The Buddha taught six element practice, which is spiritual death and so on. So we'll be able to, to, to see the antecedents in the Buddhist tradition, in the Buddha's words. And then we definitely can see a, a slightly nearer uh, influence from the, the Buddhist tradition. Hmm. So that That's satisfy great. you or have I left yeah. it hanging in the middle of the air? Well. Yeah. I thought also, I mean, there, 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 there's like um, the translation from the, the tradition and the lineage to Sangharachita. And then also you've illuminated his, his um, teaching, haven't you? 
Well, yes, as we all do. I'm sure even you do that. Done, uh, sorry, even uh, you, Dan and Utah, also do that. Uh, mm -hmm. That every time you you teach, yes, you may be teaching what Maitreya Bandhu taught, and maybe even teaching it the way Maitreya Bandhu taught. But there will be a distinctive Dana Yutan um, element to it as, as you make it your own. And this is what a tradition is. We're mm. faithful to our, our lineage. We're faithful to where we came from. But we're also trying to speak from our own experience and our own uh, uh, creative uh, uh, imagination. Mm. And especially in relation to the people we've got right in front of us. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my own way of presenting the Dhamma has changed enormously because mm. the situation in the uh, in the 70s, when I first began teaching the, the 1970s, you know, in the before the Ice Age. Uh, <laughs> before uh, I was born. <laughs> before you were born. <laughs> well, the situation was very, very different in Britain very different mm. so you spoke in a different way it's the same basic teaching but you're giving expression to it in a slightly different way i also as as uh, you probably know as well you certainly would know but others may know i spend six months of my year when i when i can in mm. india and there the, the the culture the context is so different and of course my my presentation of the dhamma there is different because it's related to the, the people who are in front of me Mm. essentially it's the same mm, 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 mm. that's great that's great so you've sort of located um i suppose yeah. what what i was trying to ask you to do is sort of like locate uh the teaching that we'll yeah. be um exploring this week um yeah. within yeah. the lineage um yeah. within within the historic yeah. history um, if i might just say a little bit more about that i think this is <laughs> one of the the the, the remarkable things about uh, uh bante sangrakshita urgyan sangrakshita uh, he's, he's done what uh, uh, great teachers have done in the past. He's taken the tradition that's come to him and made it into a, a workable whole, a usable um, a, a, a assemblage of mm. teachings and practices that are relevant to people right now. Uh, like Tsongkhapa, uh, uh, even you could go back to Nagarjuna, I'm not trying to make comparisons or anything like that, Guru Padmasambhava and uh, Zhe Yi in, uh, in, uh, in China and so forth. They all take what they've inherited and they make it into something that works now. And that's what's, what he's done. And then we are adding minor footnotes to that process uh, and uh, you know, trying to keep it up to date but still trying to be really faithful to him and to uh, the, the tradition from which he comes. Mm, mm, mm. Good. Um, shall we move on to, to the topic yeah. of integration? Okay, we better. <laughs> <laughs> so um, on integration itself, um, it's quite, a, quite an interesting, interesting word, I thought. Yes, um, yes. One of... Um, I suppose one of the connotations of the stage of integration and the idea of integration um, seems to be psychological. Um, one of the things I was thinking that was that sometimes when we think about integration, um, even in spiritual life, it does feel and sound like um, psychological mm. integration. Mm. At the same time, it, it must be more than that, you know, yeah. for it to be an aspect of spiritual life. Yeah. yeah. I thought. I wondered if you wanted to say something about integration. Um, yeah. And, yeah. yeah, that's astute and, and points to an important issue. Uh, how what integration? Uh, it, it literally means bringing wholeness. Uh, something that is two or more becomes whole, becomes one. It, 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 integra, integer in Latin means whole, mm -hmm. uh, and so it's making whole. Uh, but uh, what are you making whole? You're making yourself whole. You're making your mind whole. Mm -hmm. But what is a whole mind? Is it whole merely, merely in the psychological sense? It'd be quite something if it was even in the psychological sense. But wholeness must include the whole of us. And uh, there is that within us. There's that about us uh, that is uh, much more than the narrowly psychological if, if we interpret psychological in, in the sense of the, uh, uh, the functioning of our personality. Uh, it's something much more than that. 
uh, and ultimately it's integration with reality itself. Mm. Mm. So we're, we're integrating with the Dhamma. Uh, mm. we're, we're bringing ourselves into relationship with the, the, the depths or the heights, whichever way you like to metaphoricalize it. Mm. Uh, and uh, that is the ultimate meaning of, of, of uh, integration. And furthermore, I think it's impossible to integrate to any great extent, even at the psychological uh, level, without some reference to a much deeper, much higher uh, uh, um, meaning and purpose, mm. if you see what I mean. I don't think integration is possible beyond a certain narrow point, unless there is a connection with something that strikes to the heart of reality. Mm. Mm. Yes, um, before you've talked about um, something that you've called an integrating principle. Ah. Mm. That, is that what you were referring to just now? Y yes, uh, ultimately the integrating principle is reality itself. Mm. But of course we don't start off with a, a clear relationship with reality itself. We have some relationship to it if we are mm. practicing the, the, the Dhamma at all, because what has made us practice the Dhamma at all it is a glimpse or a glimpse of a glimpse or even a glimpse of a glimpse of a glimpse of uh, a, 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 something which we might call transcendental, something which is beyond self, beyond you, beyond me, uh, which is uh, the, the ultimate truth of things. So we start with that element. So the integrative principle in, in, in practice on the, uh, on the, the, the practical uh, level of here and now is our determination, our, our commitment to closing the gap between us now and our mm. deepest nature, mm. the deepest reality of things. In other words, it's going for refuge to the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha. Mm. Mm. But say for a beginner uh, or somebody who's fairly, fairly new um, to, to practicing the Dharma, maybe they've just come along to a meditation class or two. Um, yeah. The whole idea of um, having to integrate with reality itself <laughs> would feel like a bit abstract. Yes, if not indeed. Daunting. Yep. Um, like, what would that even mean um, if all you've done is like the mindfulness of breathing once or twice? Yeah. You know, yeah. like, what does that actually mean? In, yeah, yeah. Or if you're on the street. Yeah. Well, you you can take um, the, the, say the mindfulness of breathing because that's the emblematic practice of integration. Uh, it, it's more than that, but it is, that's what it most best represents, or that's how integration is best represented as a meditation practice. So yes, you can do that, uh, that meditation practice as a purely psychological exercise. Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, Bhante always used to stress this. And in fact, interestingly enough, he used to have the curtains closed on the shrine. We used to have a, a shrine with uh, curtains that closed it off. So when we had beginners classes, there was no Buddha present. Wow. Uh, and he stressed, well, you know, people are coming along because they want to learn to, to be a bit more uh, focused. They want to get rid of stress uh, and, and so on. So that's fine, uh, but that will only take you so far. You will begin to be able to, to concentrate, uh, to use that term, to, to focus your energies to, to uh, a, a degree at a certain level. Mm -hmm. And you may, as a result of that, get a glimpse of something on another level, more on the dhyanic level. Mm -hmm. But uh, yes, you may not at that point yet have any uh, sense of what, what uh, you know, I'm talking of under the heading of reality itself. Yeah. But uh, I think you, you, you probably, if we, if we investigate, we'll find that almost everybody has some glimpse of a higher reality. Mm. Uh, it, it, you know, I'm not saying on what level. And most people who come along to, to a class at a center like ours uh, will already have some sort of feeling for that. I, I, I don't know whether you remember it, but uh, I remember it as a, as a, a young man, um, barely a young man, but more like an adolescent. I remember sort of waking in the middle of night and just with a strong sense, there's something more. There's something I'm not understanding. I'd, I'd given up God, but mm. I knew there was something more. Mm. And so I think for many people, it's just that very distant sense that is something more, uh, mm. even if they're not able to put a name on it. They may even call it God. 
mm-hmm. fine by me. I don't mind. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I, I don't think it's the best language, but to begin with, it's fine. Mm-hmm. So I, I think that you, you, you will find that almost everybody will have some sense of uh, some higher purpose, some higher meaning to our, our human existence. I think if, 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 if there is some higher purpose and meaning to our human existence, it must be, as it were, reflected in every human soul. Uh, but just some people make it more conscious uh, mm. and other things don't get in the way. So, yes, I wouldn't, I wouldn't write people off, if you see what I mean. It, yeah, let them start with um, uh, good old um, psychological integration, which is jolly much needed. Uh, mm. But even that involves depths and heights that don't go anywhere near reality itself but just go deeper uh, mm. into into what it is to be a person uh, in, into the depths of one's own psychology but also into the depths of what is super personal supra personal in other words the sort of more archetypal dimension mm. that's um that's lovely. Um, I was just thinking that it's it, uh, um, just picking up a little bit on what you've just said about how everyone will have had a glimpse of something of something more. Hmm. Um, I was just thinking for myself. I think um, when um, in my late teens I went skiing once and I was standing oh. at the top of the mountain and you know it was just it was a wonderful time. Like I was young, I was in love. Yeah. Uh, the weather was really good yeah. it was really good yeah and, and it was like that feeling like there is a god yeah 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 well that's the only language we have for it mm. so people will naturally reach for that language that's why i'm these days reluctant to say no there is no god what i'd rather say is well i understand that you're getting at something i i don't choose that language because it's mm it's problematic Uh, but uh, I I think it may well be that what you're saying uh, through the word God is something I can easily relate to Mm. Mm. and I think that's part of our job isn't it is to try to uh, uh, um, give people a a public articulation of their private experience Mm. Mm. that's what I experienced when I first encountered uh, 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 Bhante that is as if he was saying what I'd been thinking, but not Mm. articulately, Mm. feeling, if you like, intuiting, but Mm. he was saying it, and the Buddhist tradition was saying it. Mm -hmm. Great. So let me just um, bring us back to integration. (laughs) (laughs) Well done, you're being very integrated. (laughs) Am I? (laughs) Well, the other thing I was thinking about integration was maybe like a bit more personally, you know, Sangha Rachita in his memoirs, um, he often talked as uh, of uh, Sangha Rachita one and Sangha Rachita right. two, um, and he, you know, um, Sangha Rachita one was somebody who was a poet, yeah, right, yeah, a poet, and wanted to sort of like lie under trees and write poems all day, um, and uh, Rachita two was the monk uh, who was going for refuge, very very disciplined, didn't want to write poems all day, wanted to meditate all day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and when I read that, I felt like, okay, well, that's really, really clear. But I mean, I don't think there's just like, I don't know, like in, th- in those days I had a different name, but it, um, so CN1 and CN2, I felt like there was like one to at least 39, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So maybe a, the question is for you, Subuti, as somebody who's practiced for longer, do you feel like um, you started off with more subutis and now there are fewer or? Yes, you know. one, or, one or two fewer. One uh, or two fewer. <laughs> but, but it's something like 39 to 37. <laughs> <laughs> but just like you, yes, uh, the, of course, there are, there are uh, many different currents within one, many myth, m- m- different drives and uh, different images and different myths, if you like, playing them out within one. Uh, and uh, I, I remember uh, Bhante saying once that he thought that if he hadn't encountered the Dhamma, these different uh, uh, um, drives within him would have uh, perhaps disintegrated him, mm-hmm. that he, he might not have uh, been able to sustain his sanity. It's quite a strong thing to say. He thought that the Dhamma had actually enabled him to 
integrate all these often highly uh, apparently opposing forces. I suppose for me, the strongest uh, uh, duality is uh, more to do with extroversion, introversion. This is maybe a version of what, well, no, it's not a version of what Bunt is saying, but uh, a, a, a strong uh, um, response to uh, the outer need and the sense of duty to try to meet that need uh, with great joy and uh, um, uh, because, because in, in the course of doing so, one discovers one's own powers, uh, mm -hmm. one's own abilities, uh, and really rejoicing in the exercise of my energies, if you like. So that sort of drive, uh, which takes one into the, into the world and uh, into the, the business of the world, um, uh, you know, setting up a Buddhist movement, uh, uh, contributing to building the London Buddhist Centre, and uh, working mm -hmm. really hard and with great satisfaction and at the same time, a, a, a sense of an inner life, uh, which uh, was pulling in another direction. Mm. Uh, and that uh, often, because of the, the balance of my personality was more towards the extroversion, uh, the introverted uh, didn't get enough of a look in. And it would often assert itself in uh, rather difficult ways, moodiness and, uh, and that sort of thing, and, or just no longer wanting to do it, anything. Uh, no longer wanting to do anything. So yes, I think that's the strongest dichotomy in my own uh, my own personality. It's probably familiar to many people, but you know, just the, the natural disposition of my character is to see what needs to be done, uh, and I've got a certain ability to grasp what needs to be done, and I've got enough capacity to do something about it. Uh, but at the same time, uh, that often is it's seductive because there's always more to be done. Yeah. Uh, don't you know it? Um, and, uh, uh, and, and it becomes, um, you, you know, a posture that uh, uh, you, you, it's difficult to get out of. You know, the, the, there's a famous image of the tailor's hump. If you spend all your day sewing, then you, you can't straighten your back. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a bit like that. You get stuck, the wind changes, and there you are in the extrovert pose. Uh, so, um, yeah, that, that has been the principal sort of dichotomy of my own life. And I do remember actually writing to Bante at one point saying that I thought that these, I'd got a Sabuti one and a Sabuti two, at least, you know, to begin with. And they were along these lines. Um, and and uh, that, I, I think everybody was, is going to experience something of that kind. Mm -hmm. and, and the resolution of it is not simple. You know, because it, it, what, what, what you do is you just say, OK, I'm just going to work. I'm just going to work for the Dhamma. Everything will sort itself out like that. And of course, I'd tell everybody else to do that, too. Fortunately, <laughs> much more sensible to listen to me. But, um, you, you know, you, you, you think you can resolve it by main force, mm. but you can't. Uh, and, or you think, OK, now I'm never going to do any external work at all. I'm just going to focus on the inner life. Uh, but uh, it's not it's not as easy as that. And you, you have to find uh, a way of, of balancing and, and integrating them. Some people balance by, you know, having them both present within each day. Some people balance by phases. That's more my way. So there's a phase of intense external activity and then a, a phase of fairly intense uh, uh, withdrawal. So everybody has to find their own way of of integrating these different aspects eventually of course it should be possible to be fully engaged in in uh, external activity whilst remaining totally uh, uh, as it were uh, detached from it um, mm. th that's the ideal the bodhisattva is always in samadhi uh, mm. whilst uh, being fully engaged in in the salvation of the world so integration is a slow business of getting to know these different aspects of yourself. On one level, this is a very important point that there are different sides to you. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, you, you can't immediately cram them all in. Uh, mm -hmm. Integration is not a forcible thing. Mm -hmm. It's a slow process of bringing them into relationship with each other till the point comes when they are uh, integrated. They're a mm -hmm. whole, there's mm -hmm. no opposition. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that um, that the movement of integration uh, looks like this, like a movement together, ah. whereas actually the experience of it does feel more like a tearing, oh. like a tension. Ah. 
okay. Tension yeah. between two halves. Yes. Um, yeah. Yes, you, 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 because you experience them in opposition to each other. Yeah. And but the 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 integration is by trying to it, it takes place by holding the the, the tension. Mm. And, and trying to understand it from a deeper point of view till, till you get a sense of them moving, moving into a hole. Mm. Yes, you, you experience them as intention uh, and then you have, to, you have to make decisions. OK, I'm going to focus a bit more on this side. I'm going to focus a bit more on that side until next Thursday. And then, uh, you know what I mean? You, 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 you find your own, it's not a compromise, your working relationship with these these different aspects of yourself. Mm. And in the course of doing that, they sort of come into communication with each other and begin to have more of a, um, a flavor of each other. So mm. I, I, I would like to think that these days, even when I'm engaged in uh, uh, whatever institutional or organizational affairs, I'm still uh, unable to detach myself from <laughs> trying desperately, uh, th th there's more of the flavor of the depths that come from the, the, the inner work. And mm -hmm. that when I'm doing the, the more inner work, there's a stronger sense of the outer significance of it. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's important that it's um, two ways, isn't it? Because I think, um, like say with um, the, the metaphor of, um, uh, I don't know, like activity and withdrawal, we often think of like bringing our meditation into, into our work. Yes. Um, but the second thing that you said, um, what was it? You said something like um, you, when you're doing the inner work, you're more aware of the um, external significance of it. Yes, yes, yeah, yes. So, so I, I talk about this a lot in India, where, where the, the, the uh, origins of our movement are in a response to uh, a massive injustice, the injustice of caste, mm. um, and uh, especially of... Um, uh, you know, the hierarchical uh, nature of caste. Uh, we've got our own parallels. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and that's how Dr. Ambedkar came to Buddhism as a response to that. But um, there must be also a corresponding depth. Otherwise, the breadth just loses itself in, um, in mere activity, in mere, uh, you know, politics or social activism or whatever. There has to be a depth to it. But that depth doesn't turn its back on the breadth, mm -hmm. so the, the, the depth, when you're going deeper, you, you feel you're doing it in relation to the breadth. Do you see what mm -hmm. I mean? Yeah. So that, uh, you know, for instance, I'm doing my meditation practice and I know that I'm going to be, uh, um, uh, it, have the inquisitor done a Utah to talk to. <laughs> but, uh, when I'm doing my meditation practice, I, I, I'm not consciously preparing myself, but I'm conscious that what I'm doing is 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 uh, uh, sort of making myself fit for that encounter, if you see what I mean. It's a, a, a very quick example, but uh, sort of relating that the inner and the outer to each other, both ways. It's very important. Yeah, I put you in my meta. Sorry, <laughs> I put you in my meta Baba this morning. <laughs> there we are. Well, I was thinking of you all day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, you must have reached me with your meta. Yeah. <laughs> So you, it, it's not that you, you sort of think of your meditation in utilitarian terms, but your meditation isn't a retreat from the world. And this yeah. is the Bodhisattva ideal, that yeah. your, your, your meditation is, uh, is part of your contribution. It, you're, you're going to the depths. Mm -hmm. I always like that in the, in the Christian tradition. There's the uh, idea that the, the Trappists and the other uh, completely silent orders uh, mm -hmm. are contributing to the well-being of humanity. Uh, uh, it might be a, a, a bit difficult to imagine, but that through their practice, uh, mm. they are in some way altering, the, 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 if you like, the psychic culture. Mm. And I, I actually believe there's, there's truth in that. So yes, I think you integrate uh, every activity you know, with each, every other activity, but you also integrate them with the inner and the outer poles. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, I just really, I'm just um, thinking about the Trappist monks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, I bet like um, Subuti too wanted to be a Trappist monk. Indeed, he did. He did. He did. He wouldn't have done very well at it, but that's another question. <laughs> um, yeah. I, so, I do recommend, by the way, if you're interested, a very, very good film um, which Sacha Dasa and, uh, and, and Joanna Nichola gave me called uh, Into the Great Silence, which um, is uh, uh, um, uh, an experience of a, a Trappist monastery. Uh, it's wonderful, wonderful film. I actually have that DVD under my sofa. There we are. <laughs> yeah, I see it every time I practice yoga. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, um, my, my husband's a real introvert. Okay, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, so I thought maybe before we um, stop for a little break, um, just want to go back to this thing of um, the introvert subuti and the extrovert subuti. Um, and I just wondered whether you had um, sort of like practical tips for people who, you know, might be working with um, something of that, of that tension. So I think that is actually a very, very common tension for people who get into meditation or um, sort of like want to embark on a more fully Buddhist life. Um, this this um, sense of the tension between, um, I suppose like with withdrawal um, and really concentrating on one's own practice and one's inner life and one's um, sort of, um, uh, suppose the, the, the inner work of, um, refining the dross that actually does need um, silence, yep, does yep. need quiet, um, does yep. need less input, um, but also really wanting to contribute to the world because the world needs. Yeah. Um, yep. Needs like what, what sort of um, practical hmm. you know, advice might you, hmm. you Well, the, the first thing is if you are able, if, it, if it's uh, a possibility for you, try to move into a situation in which is more, fully integrated with uh, the Dhamma life. In other words, if, 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 if you know, associate with a center, if you want to work in the center, if you, if you can live in a, in a, a community mm -hmm. so that you are in a situation which, which in which that, it, ideally, it doesn't always work like that, but that ideally it, that those, those two poles are represented. But uh, then I would say that if you can make sure that uh, there are periods when you do have the space for complete inter in, in, introversion. It's not really introversion, but the opportunity to really explore the inner world uh, through meditation. So if we are always encouraged, uh, Bhante always used to encourage us to spend one month on solitary retreat every year. Mm -hmm. Not very many people do that. There are those who do. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it, it, if you can't do a month, at least do a weekend. Mm -hmm. Just shut the door, send your partner away, uh, and um, just be alone be with yourself and of course the the the, the issue is that uh, many people will not find that so easy mm. you, you know when you have a good meditation it seems like this is the rest of your life mm. but uh, when you actually go into the rest of your life on that basis it's not so easy mm. uh, and so you need to do more integration at other levels um, mm. in order to get to get to that point mm. so I, I would say that um, try to live as integrated a life uh, where those two poles are represented uh, as you can, setting mm. up your circumstance, your situation, so that it supports both mm. poles. And mm. of course, if you possibly can work in a, move into a situation where you can directly contribute to mm. the, the spreading of the Dhamma, even if it's only coming, being the support for a class in the mm. evening, uh, mm. but do something that... Uh, means your extroverted activity or external activity is connected with the Dhamma. And that mm. will help you to strengthen the underlying sense of purpose, the integrative principle. Mm, mm, mm. I think another very important point, uh, reflecting on my own experience, uh, I've always tended to overbalance towards the extrovert. Uh, and uh, I think that's, you know, what, what is it that forms one's character? It's very difficult to say. Uh, why does one become a, a little introvert or a little extrovert? You know, it began at a very early age. Of course, it's never that simple because every, every extrovert is also an introvert and vice versa. But yeah, the balance of my personality was definitely towards the extrovert, uh, partly maybe genetic and uh, maybe just the, the, the shape of one's, uh, one's body and, and one's, one's uh, family culture and so on. Who knows? I don't know. Maybe one's past life. 
but uh, yes, for me, it's definitely been an, a, a somewhat of an overbalancing in that direction. So why is there an overbalance? And uh, uh, reflecting on it, what I think is that uh, uh, being balanced in that direction has rewarded me. Through doing, the, doing that, I've got praise, I've got gratitude, I've got all those nice things that make me feel okay about myself. I'm not saying these are bad things, mm. but perhaps there's been a slightly unhealthy investment in that, yeah. In, yeah. In, in, in being seen as, uh, well, in my own case, a leader. I seem to have been born leading. And, uh, you know, what, what, uh, uh, some of that, I, I think, is, is, is genuinely altruistic and idealistic, but there's quite a lot of it that's also uh, to do with uh, uh, enjoying the, the, the sense of, um, you know, people's uh, appreciation, even adulation at times, also the execration, but that's another question. Got to take the good with the bad. <laughs> yes, you have. The brick, Bante said, every time you're given a bouquet, there's a brick back coming. Every yeah. time a brick back comes, there's a bouquet. <laughs> but yes, I, I think there's been, uh, a, a, as it were, a psychological motivation to the mm -hmm. imbalance. Mm -hmm. So that, that needs investigation. Why is it that there's an imbalance in what? Mm -hmm. It may be just functional. You just haven't got to know the different parts of yourself. There may also be, um, you know, some uh, interest in a, from an egoistic point of view. For instance, some people who are introverted, and, and I don't mean anybody who's introverted, but some people, uh, it, why? Because they're, they're retreating from the world. They're afraid of the world. Mm. They find the world a nasty place. Mm. Uh, and so there's something a little bit to be sorted out there. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see what I mean? So th th some of the integration is a question of clearing away some of the, uh, uh, the, 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 the personality uh, um, the traits that yeah. condition it. Yeah. Yeah. So about knowing the personality traits and sort of taking yes. responsibility for them. Yes. Yeah. Sort of way so that they don't hold you back. No. But yeah. th this, will not, this is not the work of a day. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, it's a question of sort of discovering slowly. And mm. just sort of realizing, I remember, you know, when I, I was chair of the LBC, uh, again, uh, probably before you were born, no, probably not quite before you were born, but many years ago, mm. and uh, uh, when the dinosaurs still roamed London. And uh, um, I remember when I stopped being chair, I had a, a sudden feeling of emptiness mm. because I didn't know who I was. In other mm. words, I'd identified with the role of chair. Yeah. I'm not saying this is the whole story. I, I don't rubbish my poor little uh, thirty-year-old self at all. But um, that that was a, that was an element in it. And oh, ah, ah, this is uncomfortable. Why? Ah, I've in, overinvested in this. Mm. Yeah, so you 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 ha you learn slowly, and particularly through friends. Yes. Friends who feed back to you. They tell you and help yeah. you. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, at best they help you. At worst, they they just tell you very bluntly because they're fed up with it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, bluntly but kindly, with your best interests at heart. Yeah, of course, yeah, but sometimes not so much. But at best, if they do kindly. But yeah. sometimes you get the best feedback is, is is when somebody just bursts. But you, it's tough to take that. Yeah, yeah. And, and never do it to somebody else for that purpose. And I'm speaking to myself there. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so um, what we're going to do now is we're going to have a little break, so just uh, about three or four minutes, um, just to let people know who are watching us on YouTube that um, we will have a little space for questions for Sabuti. So if um, he said anything that um, I haven't sort of um, drawn out fully enough or that you haven't quite understood, um, do write in the little chat box. Um, and, and um, you know, Sibuti will be taking some questions around the um, around the theme of these five aspects of spiritual life, the five essential aspects of spiritual life, um, and particularly this evening integration. Okay, so just a little break uh, for a cup of tea or um, a leave break if you want one, and we'll be back in about three or four minutes. Good. Good. See you in a moment, Sibuti. Okay.
So you need to unpin them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. I think we might be back. Um, all right, Subiti? Yep, I'm fine. Good. Okay. okay. I'm that's enjoying good. myself. Are you? Oh, that's good. <laughs> um, I thought I was actually going to make a little detour now. Okay. Um, yeah, so, yeah, just welcome back, everybody. Um, so, I know this evening is about integration, but one of my reflections was that um, I think particularly I went back uh, to the Padma Loka talks from 2013, um, where you, you did a whole retreat on the system of practice. And um, it's, it's one of my favorite series of talks from Padma Loka. I must say, Stubuti, like they were, they were excellent. Good. And um, I thought one of the key concepts that, um, well, one of the concepts that sort of underlay the whole of the teaching series was actually the niyamas, so the laws of conditionality. Um, and I just wondered if you might want to give a brief tour of them just to set this up for the rest of the week. Right. So the, the uh, uh, essential um, philosophical principle of, of Buddhism uh, coming from the Buddha himself is that everything that arises arises in dependence on conditions mm -hmm. so the the what appears all appears uh, because of pre-existing conditions and mm -hmm. itself then conditions something further so this is the essential principle and it applies to us everything in our our conditioned uh, uh, being is well conditioned it arises in dependence on conditions but uh, so conditionality is a set of uh, regularities, um, ways in which um, conditions function. Uh, when you have a certain set of conditions, you will get a certain uh, consequent. Uh, and uh, those regularities function according to different, well, they, they amount to different laws. Mm -hmm. And uh, those laws can be gathered under various headings. And in uh, later commentarial tradition, and this has been much used by, by Bante and uh, by us, uh, the, there are five different niyamas, which mean orders or, or laws. Um, the modern Indian word for law is niyama. Um, so that there, are, there are five different orders of law. Uh, so you have um, uh, rutu niyama, utu niyama, which is the physical inorganic, you have the uh, bija niyama, which is the organic, uh, the manu niyama, which is the lower uh, stimulus response, instinctive, a mental kind of uh, functioning, the perceptual functioning. Mm -hmm. And then you have karma niyama, which is the functioning that uh, arises, the kind of conditionality that arises when you have a, uh, a sense of self mm -hmm. uh, distinguished from other. And then finally, there's Dhamma Niyama, which is when that sense of self begins to break down and something of a transcendental nature begins to function within you. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, that changes the kind of conditionality that, that appears. So you, you, could, you could look at uh, the question of integration in terms of these five Niyamas. Mm -hmm. So you could say that uh, I need to integrate Phys with my physical being mm -hmm. which means actually accepting that I've got one uh, mm -hmm. that it is of a certain kind and character and uh, it may have certain quirks it may have certain deficiencies or illnesses and uh, that it needs to be cared for uh, that it obeys conditioned laws so that uh, well we you know we very well know um, you know if you ingest certain substances alcohol amongst others it, it alters your body's functioning and, and uh, your nervous system uh, and uh, has an effect upon the mind itself. So uh, the, the, the body is very susceptible to uh, conditions. Uh, there are certain conditions it operates favorably under and certain ones it doesn't. And it's very, very important, I think, for Buddhists to accept the body. Mm. I think there's a big tendency for spiritual people 
to sort of neglect that dimension. So integration will mean integrating with your physical experience uh, mm. and, and with your, your the, the conditions that make up your body and mm. uh, 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 working intelligently with them, eating healthy food, uh, giving yourself sufficient exercise. Uh, and, and of course, that even goes further into recognizing your kinship with nature, mm. uh, the natural world around you. So integration goes uh, right down to those depths. Uh, integration means being aware of your body and being aware of it as a conditioned phenomenon and uh, working with it as such. Uh, and then, of course, that uh, your body is both the, the physical and the organic uh, you know, I don't need to say anything extra about that. The manoniyama is the, um, uh, the, the, the level of uh, perceptual and stimulus response and so forth. So uh, I, I notice this a lot getting older because my body, my, my, uh, the, the kind of lower mind doesn't work as quickly. So, uh, you know, for instance, it never used to take me time to adjust to travel mm -hmm. uh, because I could override the body's natural sort of uh, uh, um, its sense of displacement. I can't do it anymore. I don't have the same energy to do that. Yeah. So I notice much more that for a while I'm a bit confused. Yeah. But it's not, it's not, I, I can't, how, how can I put it? It's not my confusion. I'm not confused, whatever that would mean. It's mm -hmm. that, that um, those mechanisms within me, I haven't taken sufficient care of. So, mm -hmm. you know, adjusting to new circumstances, it takes time. Yeah. I, I've always been very, very quick, but that's largely a matter of will, if you yeah. see what I mean, and, and it's at a cost. Yeah. So you need to you need to take into account the uh, uh, the, 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 the the natural mind, the, the mind of the animal mind within you, mm -hmm. uh, the instinctive mind, the perceptual mind and so on. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, this is much more familiar territory. We need to integrate with our ethical responsibility we need to take on board that we are. Uh, responsible for our actions and those actions condition us in the future and then finally yes we try to integrate with reality uh, which is the dhamma mm. so yes that the, this the schema is very very important I, i'd recently talking with uh, a, um, a, a a a health practitioner who was saying that she she experienced um uh, uh, the, the attitude that people had uh, to the work that was being done in, in the in the health in the therapy uh, affected things very strongly and uh, she, she thought that some people had a materialist view thought everything could be fixed just with a pill some people have a sort of neg negation of the body view often even buddhists have this view and then it's very difficult to work with them because they think what's the body got to do with it it's all mm. my mind mm -hmm. and so on so i think that uh, even for our basic health uh, a, a proper attitude and an integration of all these niyamas is extremely important. Mm. It struck me as you were speaking that um, what you were saying about um, taking into account just um, getting old and yeah. um, this thing about just uh, feeling a bit confused, um, yeah. sometimes disorientated, yeah. um, that your response was a very a particularly wise response, like a mature response. Yes. Um, you know, because an alternative response might be uh, denial. Uh, yeah. Denial. I've tried that. I've tried that. <laughs> Have you? <laughs> doesn't not last. Happening. I am not it doesn't work. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. But um, yeah, so it just sort of sounded like integration actually is a maturing. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a growth. Yeah. Okay. Well, you, you could put it in terms of, of uh, integrating with nature. You know, like at the moment, uh, we're in Britain and uh, autumn, the seasons are so strong, aren't they? And in, in, in autumn, everything's closing down mm. um, and it's moving towards winter. Mm. Uh, well, th there are rhythms in our own life. And in mm. a way, I could say that I'm in the autumn of my life. Right. And, and, and that uh, 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 it, it, I, I need to, to, to come to terms, well, not come to terms with it. I need to just accept that work with that and not not think oh gosh i'm going into autumn isn't that dra a drag when will it be summer again Th that's hopeless yeah. but actually autumn is a very very beautiful season yeah. i'm really delighting in autumn up here and actually this this phase in my life 
uh, the autumn of my life is 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 a very beautiful one because uh, I'm no longer driven by those uh, youthful ambitions um, and, and that sort of you know uh, you know for instance the insistence of sex and all those sort of things they yeah. they've kind of died down uh, yeah. and uh, so it, you know I can I can enjoy uh, yeah. something of the peace of it uh, and. Uh, you know, I've got, I've got some intelligence left and I've got some experience so I can put that to use. Do you see what I mean? So I think that integration, it, it, it's, it's good to think of it in terms of integrating with nature because mm. then you're, you're aware of yourself, at least in the, uh, in the lower Niamas, as yeah. part of nature. Yeah. And you, you, you accept yourself as having those rhythms. Yeah. And... Um, uh, you, you you can come to terms with them. It's come to terms with them is completely the wrong word. It, you can gracefully accept them and and uh, live with them with uh, with pleasure. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That sounds very beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Yeah. When I mem remember. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I want to ask you one question, which I've been dying to ask you for years, actually. Oh dear. Yeah. Which is about the Dharma Niyama. So you didn't say very much about it um, when you just gave us that quick tour no, of the Niyamas. And, um, hmm. But um, one of the one of the examples that's often uh, used or drawn out um, in our in our particular tradition is um, yeah, when talking about the Niyama, uh, Dharma Niyama is um, Bhante comforting the Ambekarite oh. students, uh, when he right. died. Uh, when Ambedkar had died, and I have often wondered about the Dharma Niyama, whether it needs an objective situation to draw it forth. Um, I suppose when I felt the Dharma Niyamas hmm. in, my, in my own experience, it just felt like I was responding to something that was hmm. in front of me. Hmm. I just w wondered about that. Yes, yes, so, it, so, so that, that situation was one in which he, he found himself uh, confronted by uh, this terrible disaster, which left people absolutely bereft. And mm -hmm. what he said of himself is that he felt he was functioning as if he was an impersonal force. He later said, suprapersonal would have been a better way of putting it, uh, mm -hmm. a non-personal force. In other words, his, his self got out of the way. Mm -hmm. And that's what we mean. That's an experience, presumably, of the Dharmaniyama. It's certainly mm -hmm. a good way of explaining it mm -hmm. and I think that does characteristically happen in situations where um, there's an objective demand upon you uh, I, I don't know whether you, you experience this in giving talks sometimes mm -hmm. you yeah. just find you're saying things saying things you didn't know you knew yeah. uh, and uh, that uh, are, are quite fresh and new yeah. and, and and you really feel you can't take credit for them mm -hmm. uh, they come from somewhere else you yeah. know, whether it's absolutely the Dhamma we're talking about or some inspiration in a more poetic sense is difficult to say. But mm -hmm. it's that sort of experience where you definitely feel your uh, something is drawn from you. Mm -hmm. But I have to say it, 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 it may uh, uh, be experienced more in solitude. It mm -hmm. may be that under those circumstances that you you find yourself just sort of uh, going beyond yourself. I remember reading a very good book. Um, oh dear, I now can't remember the title of it, but it was about a, uh, a man who was not a Buddhist at all, but who spent uh, some years living completely alone in the, in the Cambrian mountains in Wales. Mm -hmm. And he described how after a certain point, he realized he'd just become part of everything. Mm. He disappeared. Mm. He was just uh, responding. And then he said something like, maybe this is what the Buddhists are talking about. So it may be, uh, it, it can come about in all sorts of different ways. Mm. And, uh, you know, if you read something like William James, The Varieties of Religious Experience, some of those, whether they're the Dharma Niyama, as I say, it, it's difficult to pronounce. Uh, certainly on one level they are, but mm. they, they come about in very strange circumstances. One of them of a, a, a Yorkshire policeman who used to live uh, way across the Dales and walk from his station uh, every evening as the sun was setting and he said he would move into a state of mind which was completely uh, beyond himself beautiful description mm. so I, I don't think one can prescribe the circumstances however mm. I think that uh, a, a very common circumstance is where you are working very closely with other people in an unambiguously altruistic context 
where there's no doubt that you're working for the benefit of others, even if your own motivation is also for personal glory, as it were, uh, to some extent. But in those circumstances, something is triggered uh, in you that, that takes you beyond yourself. So I think that is uh, um, very commonly experienced like that, mm. but not exclusively. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Dhamma Niyama does not obey rules. It will happen in its own way. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to know. That's good to know. I, I, um, actually, thanks for drawing that out about the sol solitude. Um, yeah. You're right, because um, obviously on solitary retreats, I've felt something something other sometimes. You know? Yes, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and often that's in the form of a re response to the natural world around one, yeah. uh, but not, not in a in a in a in a shallow sense and not in a, in a something even almost more than poetic sense. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the great poets, that's what they talk about, where, you know, there's famous uh, Wordsworth, uh, something uh, more deeply interfused, mm -hmm. um, something in, in, the, in the heart of things that sensed. Uh, mm -hmm. which draws you beyond you so, yourself. Mm -hmm. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. So no particular circumstances. Although, you, you know, I think those, those circumstances of, of community working very closely together mm -hmm. are particularly productive in that way. Yeah. For an yeah. altruistic purpose. Mm. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. Um, I just had this um, m memory of um, one of my teachers, I think it might have been Maitre Bandhu telling me that there is nowhere that is apart from the sacred. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. Well, it, in, in a way, you know, some Buddhist schools sort of stress that uh, everything that we, that appears, uh, appears ultimately from, from the, the depths of reality. Mm. Where else can it come from? <laughs> uh, so all appearance is ultimately uh, dharma. Yeah. That doesn't mean that, um, you know, just um, enjoying a jolly good time is the Dhamma. But it means that if you can really trace uh, uh, back to its source, as it were, every experience that you have, there's the Dhamma within it. And this mm -hmm. is expressed is particularly in the, in the Tantra, mm -hmm. uh, so that uh, ordinary objects are invested with the sacred. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um... Oh, I've got so many responses to that, but I, I think I better go to the uh, to the questions that people have asked. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. So I have to rein myself in. Yes. <laughs> so, so, I'm sorry. I was really, right, I, 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 we're really going somewhere rather interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I just yeah. want to start talking about Vajra Zoom. Vajra Zoom might be a thing. Yes. You know, yeah. Like a yeah. Zoom thing. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Oliver's asked a really interesting question. Um, okay. In a way, it itself sounds like uh, I wish I had asked this right at the start, but Oliver, Oliver is like, no, I should like bring it out. He asks, "Why is integration so important for spirituality?" Huh. Oh. Hmm. Hmm. Well, uh, it is possible to reach quite high or deep. Again, depends on your metaphorical preferences, uh, but uh, you can reach quite high. Uh, you can even touch on the transcendental. But uh, if there's not integration, it's difficult to stabilize that. Uh, you, you know, you, you, uh, you may actually have some, some very, very deep experience, but it may not be possible for you to uh, live that out because it, it's either possessed by uh, a disconnected part of your own personality or it becomes for you a way of escaping parts of your personality. This has been talked of under the, the, the happy phrase of spiritual bypass. Mm. Uh, and I think that is a, a, a genuine phenomenon. And, you know, I know from personal experience, you can, you can use your spiritual experience, your genuine spiritual experience, uh, as uh, uh, it becomes appropriated by your disintegrated personality. So, it's not to say that that sort of experience isn't, isn't valuable, but you then need to do a lot of work to, to stabilize it. I remember on a, on a solitary retreat I had, uh, I was alone for eight months, uh, about 12 years ago, and uh, had a very, very vivid experience of uh, the transcendental, I think I can say, uh, whether how many um, 
glass partitions that were be between me and it, I'm not able to say, but I could see it very, very clearly. And at the same time, I could see this, this sort of flow of unresolved karma that was me. Mm. And uh, I saw that, yes, that, that's right, that's true. I can see that, but now I've got to work down here to uh, create a, a, a base for it. You know, you can have um, beautiful uh, wine poured, but if there's no uh, cup or the cup is cracked, the glass is cracked, it, it just pours all over the place. It, it, uh, and uh, the, the worst thing is that it may actually become destructive because it's appropriated by a, uh, a disintegrated personality. And when you, when you say destructive, you mean like destructive for the practitioner and also the situation? Or, or maybe even the situation. It, it, very interesting. I read a, a, a biography of Ayatollah Khamenei uh, uh, recent, once, and uh, he was um, actually a, a, um, a Sufi poet. Mm. And, uh, you know, it wasn't the best of po Sufi poetry, but it was definitely Sufi poetry of some quality. Yeah. And he, he, he clearly had a strong feeling for, uh, you know, at least a spiritual dimension, I don't say transcendental, but that, that became appropriated to a particular uh, perspective on, uh, on society and on uh, spiritual practice and spiritual life, which uh, caused enormous uh, suffering, mm. um, in, in my view, and at least certainly in the view of the biographer. So do you see what I mean? O often I think uh, spiritual leaders have some genuine spiritual insight. I think that even within my own acquaintance, I know people who claim to have had a transcendent experience and I don't doubt them. The problem is they haven't got the basis to stabilize it. And that then can mean that they mm. get inflated, mm. that the spiritual experience becomes uh, appropriated by the ego identity, which is not an integrated one. Mm. So I think integration is extremely important. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, so these, these questions might tie in. So you've got two questions on um, vertical and horizontal integration. Oh. Mm. Um, someone, uh, I think it's Jerry. Jerry has asked you to define uh, what vertical and horizontal integration might be. Right. And um, Nagesh has asked, what um, role Diana plays in vertical integration? Right. Yes. So, so uh, um, horizontal integration is uh, mainly to do with making sure that uh, that there's sort of one continuity of of ordinary purpose, so that when you do the mindfulness of breathing, you sustain your purpose. When you ask questions of Subhuti, you, you remember what you're trying to talk about, integration, and don't let Subhuti drag you all over the place. Um, you, you know, it, it's where you're able at the psychological level to keep a sense of, of continuity of purpose. Let's put it as simply as that. A vertical integration, I think you could say, has, well, many levels, but two principal levels. One is the integration of uh, uh, energies, um, uh, that are not normally accessible to consciousness, to ordinary consciousness. And this is where jhana comes into play. Mm -hmm. So that you would be uh, experiencing higher, to put it that way, uh, metaphorical uh, perspective, uh, higher states of consciousness that are much more uh, uh, integrated, much more subtle, um, and so on. Uh, you could also say that uh, um, meditation in this way can integrate the deeper forces within one. So uh, in, 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 uh, in meditation, one may experience visions, uh, and one may experience encounters with uh, uh, divine beings. Uh, it doesn't seem so common these days, but in the Buddha's day, this was very common. Uh, you, you would experience uh, um, a, a level of reality which you could say was within you in, in, in a sort of Jungian point of view, the archetypal dimension of consciousness that may come out in your meditation. It may come out in, um, in dreams, for instance, or in, in imaginative experience generally. Uh, I think dreams are very important for vertical and horizontal integration. Uh, I, I, I think it's extremely important to remember your dreams and try to uh, connect with the energy in them. 
and the, the, the images and the, uh, the power of the images, because some of that may be helping you to integrate yourself at a, vert at a horizontal level. Some of it will be connecting with deeper uh, energies within, your, within you. But yes, meditation is a way in which you integrate with uh, higher states of consciousness. Um, if, you're, if you're really getting into dhyana, not merely into a forcible state of, uh, of temporary um, quiescence, uh, you, you will be bringing your energies together. But I don't think it's enough. I, and, and I think this is especially the case in the modern world. I think we need to be doing a lot more work uh, at, the, uh, at the ordinary level because life is so complex. So I think uh, human friendship is the most important thing where you're, you're entering into deep communication with others, where you're able to unravel yourself to yourself mm. uh, and uh, th th discover yourself. Mm. So yes, I'd say that um, uh, uh, um, that's as important as meditation, certainly in the early stages of, of, of spiritual practice, in other words, for the first 20 or 30 years, uh, uh, that sort of um, connection with others is, is invaluable. Mm. Great. Um, okay, so let's take one more question. Um, yeah, let's do this one from Liz. Um, so she says she's a newbie. I think that's what she's saying. I'm sorry. Uh, that she says she's a newbie. A newbie. A newbie. <laughs> yeah. Good. Welcome. Uh, yeah. And so thinking about the shadow self, or how. What do we do with negative parts of us when we work on integration? No, I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that clearly. Yeah. So There's... I think the question is, um, how do you work on your negative parts of yourself? The negative you... parts of yourself, yes. yeah. Within, oh. within the structure of working on integration. Right. Mm. Uh, but of course, it depends what one means by negative parts of oneself. Uh, presumably what one means is negative mental states. I don't think there are exactly any negative parts of yourself. Mm. And, and one of the things I often say to people when they come saying that, uh, you know, I, I want to get rid of my anger, uh, particularly anger seems to be the issue. Um, well, I, I always, huh? Yeah? And sometimes people are also are very self-critical. Ah, yes. Yeah, like a self, yes. that feels yeah. like a part, you know? Yeah, okay. Mm. Uh, w w w yes, well then I think that with, uh, there are different things that one would say with different things. Mm. So for instance, with anger, there's clearly a lot of energy that is not finding an outlet. So one needs to, to uh, um, work out what that, how to give that a, a, a more uh, fulfilling outlet. I know this, I have angry dreams every night, uh, now and again, not every night, every now and again. And I know that those angry dreams are telling me that there's an there's energy, very deep energy within me that is not fulfilled. Mm. So I value those angry dreams. Mm. Uh, mm. Uh, and so I think that often if you look at these negative parts of yourself, it's merely aspects of your own energy that are not finding a positive uh, outlet. So for instance, if you're very self-critical, well, uh, th there's obviously a, a, a high idealism there. There's obviously a, a part of you that uh, really wants to be uh, better. If it's not, of course, just your, your, your mummy or daddy's voice uh, going in your mind. But it, it, whether it is or isn't, it's now you. Yeah. So it, it, it's, you, you probably need to apply that sort of critical faculty to uh, engaging with the Dhamma. Mm. So uh, really engaging with the, uh, the finer points of the Dhamma. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm, I may not be hitting the, the nail exactly on the head, but the, the, the find a, a right purpose for the energy. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 these things that appear negative are merely negative in their, in their present incarnation. Uh, but there's energy there that needs to be put to better use. Um, and uh, so I remember Bante used to stress actually, um, uh, you know, if you've got that critical faculty, um, well, apply it to, um, you know, analyzing argument. 
if you mm. see what I mean, you know, mm. look at the newspaper and, and see where there's problems with, with, with the argument. Not, not, not that you're, you're, you're being hateful or whatever, but you're just saying, ah, that doesn't work. Yeah. And I have a, a, a very good friend who I've seen him do that. He used to be so critical of himself and then critical of everybody else. But now he's put it to uh, the use of, of, of really good philosophical thinking. So uh, y y work out what that energy is and try to find its most productive and fulfilling expression. Mm. I, yeah. I, there's no energy that has to be uh, chopped off. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Mental I mean, states, yeah, you have to change them, but the yeah. energy itself you need to connect with and find a better fulfillment. Yeah. I like that. I like that. Like finding the idea of finding really. Um, satisfactory and sort of a really appropriate outlets um, for for um, I suppose like the different our, our different um, selves. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I I prefer to think of it in terms of energy. Yeah, uh, I, I, I'm not quite convinced by the the, the parts the of the yeah, yeah, but yeah. there are sort of these different energies within you, mm -hmm. and uh, they they uh, which make up you. And so you try to find the most um, most uh, uh, effective and fulfilling uh, outlet for them. I'd be sort of noticing behind your right shoulder there's Manjushri's sword. Your left, your right shoulder, Manjushri's sword. Well, that that's if you like the critical sword. Uh, it's uh, you know it could be self criticism. It could be you know cutting your friends to pieces, but it yeah. can be cutting ignorance to pieces. Yeah. 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 Mm. Yeah, which is much more um, useful yeah. and um, enjoyable. Yeah. yeah, you'll feel so much better for that. You might enjoy the, the, the you know, the cutting your friends down to size, but it'll be a, 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 a hollow victory, uh, which won't give you much real satisfaction. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. So I, th I think it's important never to reject these energies within oneself, but to recognize that their present expression is not skillful. Uh, yeah. and, and both for you and for others, and try to see where they might be more productive. Mm. Good. Um, I think we need to start to wrap up, Subuti. Um, okay. Before before I do that, is there anything else that you want to sort of add? Um, you know, any bit that you felt that you'd like to draw out more? Oh my goodness. Um, uh, I I I I think I've. Um, uh, I've nothing that I, I feel is left over. There's so much that we could say about everything, and I'd really like to continue a discussion with you because I found that very uh, engaging and uh, drawing drawing my thoughts out. But no, I'm not left with anything that I think. Oh, I wish I'd said that or whatever. Probably tonight I'll wake up thinking that. But yeah. Yeah. well, you can um, bring that energy into tomorrow's. Um... Okay, yeah. <laughs> I'll ring you up in the middle of the night and. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, gosh, there's so much I want to say, Sabuti. I, I think I want, maybe next time we'll talk about dreams. That would be really good. Ah, yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, so I just want to start to wrap up by making a little um, dana announcement. So in a moment, um, Katrine and Britta, who are our tech, um, tech fairies, um, are going to put the link into, into the um, chat box. And um, I just really, really want to encourage you all, um, all 127 of us, um, probably more because I know there are a few communities watching um, together, um, to give. And tonight, we're going to be um, giving to a very, very special cause, which is um, we're going to be um, giving to Subuti. So oh. um, and <laughs> what you can do when you go onto our Just Giving um, site is just to select um, giving to Subuti. Um, and I just really want all of you to um, give to Subuti because in a way, although we are giving to Subuti, what we're really, really giving to is um, the work that Subuti does, um, the work that Subuti does um, around the world, uh, supporting other Buddhists um, to go for refuge. So particularly Subuti um, mentioned earlier, he, he spends um, nor in normal years half his year in India, helping some of the most deprived um, communities, uh, deprived Buddhist communities there to um, 
Well, I suppose it's really does just what he did tonight. Um, does really, really encourage and um, inspire and teach and um, t translate uh, the Dharma into something that's really accessible, really relevant. Subhuti doesn't just teach in India, of course, you know, he's president of the London Buddhist Center, and he also does quite a lot of work in Hungary, um, around, amongst the gypsies in, uh, in Hungary, and he supports um, Buddhists in, that, in those communities too. So I just really want to encourage all of you um, to, to give to Subhuti tonight, um, and to give to all the people um, that Subhuti supports um, through giving to Subhuti. Thank you. Yeah. And um, what we're going to do now is uh, we're going to do the transference of, of merit and self-surrender just to finish. So um, maybe let's just all sit quietly uh, for a moment. And um, I'll do it in call and response. So even if you're new um, to the transference of merit and self-surrender, you might just want to follow along. Um, I'll say a line and you can just say the line back. But for now, um, let's just settle. Um, Transference of merit and self-surrender. May the merit gained in my acting thus go to the alleviation of the suffering of all beings. My personality throughout my existences my personality throughout my existences, my possessions, my possessions, and my merit in all three ways, and my merit in all three ways, I give up without regard to myself, I give up without regard to myself, for the benefit of all beings, for the benefit of all beings, just as the earth and other elements, just as the earth and other elements, are serviceable in many ways. Are serviceable in many ways. To the infinite number of beings. To the infinite number of beings. Inhabiting limitless space. Inhabiting limitless space. So may I become. So may I become. That which maintains all beings. That which maintains all beings. Situated throughout space. Situated throughout space. So long as all have not attained, so long as all have not attained to peace. To peace. Well, thank you very much, Subhuti. Um, I've so enjoyed that. Yeah. yeah, 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 it was great. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Um, so let's just say goodbye and good night to everyone who's watching us. Um, so thank you, all of you, for joining us from all the way across the world, um, Australia to New York to Mexico, um, you know, far flung Cardiff to um, East Anglia. Um, I know the Vajrasana guys were joining us and um, yeah, thank you all of all of you. And um, Subhuti is going to be teaching meditation um, tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. So you can join, join him. I just really want to encourage you to do that. And also he'll be back tomorrow night with Pranyamanas talking about positive wow. emotion. Oh. Okay. Good. So good night and let's end the stream. Bye Goodbye. guys. Good night.
Okay, Subuti, you still there? <laughs> 